Okay, good evening. Um, this is going to be the first episode of a blog, video blog that I plan to start doing. Uh, it's going to be entitled The Rambling Observer. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself, first of all, and what we're going to try to accomplish tonight. Um, my name is Marvin Huddleston. Uh, I've been an amateur astronomer. Oh, since probably, if I go back to the time I first got interested in astronomy, you're talking 1961 for a long time now. I've been involved in astronomy. Uh, let me tell you how this all started. My grandfather lived in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, it's one of those deals where he was my biological grandfather. My mother, of course, is a biological father. And he did not have much uh, in involvement with my mother uh, during her lifetime um, from the time I'm guessing from the time he moved to Honolulu until he died in 1965. Um, there was a period of time that he came a couple of times to the United States to see mom. Um, he traveled here in 1961, which is when I first met my grandfather at age six. Uh, one of my great memories of my lifetime was him taking me out under the stars and showing me constellations and stars and galaxies and talking to me about astronomy in general. And um, he probably had no idea what he had done that night. Uh, he turned me into a passionate amateur astronomer for the rest of my life with that one event. It's that one time of taking me out under the stars. He was an interesting man. Um, I was doing genealogy research on my family, and one of the things I could not ever quite figure out is um, uh, Herbert Clinton Carroll, which was his name. I found in mom's possessions once a, a typewritten letter or a typewritten note that she had written down some thoughts of his when he was uh, at a younger age, around 1938. My favorite quote today is from that document. Um, Herbert Clinton Carroll, my grandfather, said in 1938, Sometimes I look out into the stars and I wonder if our works look as small to God as his looks great to us. Um, when I found that, it actually blew me away because I was always wondering and actually worrying about his spiritual condition. I wondered if he was a believer in Jesus Christ, if he, you know, I, I didn't know that much about him. But anyway, he came here in 1961, introduced me to astronomy, as I mentioned. Um, he came back again. Uh, I don't know if it's 1962, 1963 when he did that. But when he, told, when he was telling me about astronomy on one of those visits, probably the, the visit he and I had in 1961, he told me one of the things he, he was going to do, he said, I'm going to build you a telescope and I'll bring it here and give it to you. Unfortunately, he died before he was able to make good on that, that promise. And my, one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping that I can do as a grandfather myself is leave a legacy like he left with me. And he didn't intend to do this. He, he was he didn't come here thinking i really want to figure out a way to turn my grandson into an astronomer um to tell you more about my grandfather uh he was in the army back in the 1920s i believe it was uh he served for three or four years in the united states army um he probably at some point re-enlisted during the whole crisis with germany and Adolf Hitler and all of that that was going on. Um, he wound up as a lieutenant, is what I believe I've discovered he was, in the, the United States Navy during World War II. His job with the Navy was making instruments. He's listed in some documentation I found as an instrument maker. And it kind of explained one of my, my um, con points of confusion about him I kept looking in documentation, um, looking through military records and things like this, like that, um, trying to find information on him. I kept finding an 8C Carroll listed on all these different ships. And it was kind of puzzling because I didn't understand. Um, I kept thinking, who, you know, how many Herbert C. Carrolls or 8C Carrolls are there in the Navy? 
and why are they all on these different ships? I thought, wow, have I discovered a, a family thing here that there's all these cousins and people that went to, to fight in world war II um, and wound up with him um, in, in Hawaii and Honolulu. Well, when I found out that he was an instrument maker and his rank being a Lieutenant, it, as I researched that, it became apparent that the reason he kept showing up on all these muster rolls, these different ships, was because he was on those ships working on equipment, working on instruments that were used by that ship, uh, by that ship's crew. Uh, so that's why he kept showing up on these different muster rolls. Uh, one of the ships I know he was on was the Hornet, which was an aircraft carrier. There were some battleships I found him on. There were some merchant marine ships I found him on, just uh, all kinds of different sailing vessels. Uh, he was involved in, on, in doing that. Now, one of my theories, or one of my, my, the theories my sister and I have kind of come up with is the reason that he probably showed up around the, the 60s uh, to visit and to reconnect with his daughter and, and meet his grandson and his, gr and his granddaughter, my sister. Um, he, um, we believe that what had happened was that he had been diagnosed as having a, 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 a serious illness. And when he died in 1965, he died of a, of basically a heart attack. Um, uh, the term I'll think of the term later and put that in, in this blog, but, uh, that's kind of how I wound up being an amateur astronomer. Now, what, uh, what happened in my life? Um, I got interested, interested in astronomy. I pursued it, uh, late. I didn't start pursuing it obviously at, I think I was nine, uh, six years old, 1961, but around the time I was probably eight or nine years old, I started getting very serious about astronomy. Um, I joined a group in Dallas, the junior Texas astronomical society. We called it JTAS. Um, got very involved with that organization and became a vice president in 1971 of JTAS. Um, 1971 was also the date that I traveled with another gentleman that drove me um, as he was heading to the National Convention of the Astronomical League and the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Um, I had already probably around 1969 started observing, doing serious research observations. Here I was a young, young guy um, for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. And in 1971, I went to a convention with this guy and met a lot of my, my heroes like uh, Harry Jameson, uh, Father Kenneth Delano, who I had first started working with in the ALPO as, uh, in, in, we were, we were studying objects called dark haloed craters, which are craters on the moon that have a dark halo around them, um, from an impact or a volcanic event. And it, as it turns out, as we studied, uh, these objects, it became very apparent that these were volcanic objects. So what we were looking at was volcanic cones on the moon, moon surface. Uh, around 1970, that program, uh, or around maybe 1971, that program uh, concluded and was closed by Dr. Uh, by, by, um, Kenneth Delano. Uh, he passed me off, sort of, to a guy named Harry Jameson. And I started working with Harry Jameson studying uh, volcanic lunar domes, which are basically shield volcanoes uh, like we have here on Earth. Very very uh, gentle sloped objects. Uh, the average lunar dome does not exceed five degrees in elevation. It's a very, uh, if you were standing on one, you probably could walk over it and not realize you were on a big hill. Uh, they're very gentle slope. You would realize you gained some elevation, but it wasn't anything real striking. Um, so you could probably walk right across one fairly easily. Uh, most of the round uh, versions of volcanic lunar domes have a cone or a crater at their summit. Um, sometimes they're very centered, 
on that object. Sometimes they were off-centered. Those were off-centered. But anyway, I got very involved in doing that, uh, especially after 1971. I later became a member of the lunar staff of the Association of Lunar Planetary Observers. I ran the lunar day. Well, I started out when I started out as a staff member, I ran a program called the Selected Areas Program. And during that time, um, I approached the ALPO board about restarting the, the uh, Lunar Dome Survey again and trying to conclude that, that or, I never felt that the Lunar Dome Survey was concluded. Uh, it, we just stopped doing it. Uh, we had not finished the catalog. We had not uh, finalized all the work. I thought there was still work to be done. Uh, so that I did that for a number of years, and uh, we had some opposition from some folks. Um, that's another story. But uh, anyway, needless to say, um, all of these things have led me to where I am today. Um, today, I am a, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in London. I'm a member of the Texas Astronomical Society. Uh, I've been involved uh, in di various ways uh, trying to popularize astronomy and going planning to get more into that now that I'm getting up to retirement age. My wife and I have bought a little Casita uh, travel trailer that's currently about to be built for us. We're supposed to pick that up in January. And one of the things and one of my dreams has always been to combine my astronomy interest with um, my faith and my calling, I feel, of, of God in, in doing apologetics, basically. Uh, one of the things I want to do with the casitas travel around the areas and be able to share the gospel through astronomy. So that's kind of one of the directions my life's going to take uh, here the next few years. Um, but anyway, on this uh, blog that we're going to do called the, the Rambling Observer, we're going to do, we're going to talk about some, some various aspects of astronomy. Um, I'm hoping to give some instruction and some education to anyone that, that decides to listen to me babble <laughs> about all these things. Um, I'm hoping to help educate you in astronomy and help other people get a passion for astronomy like I have had. Astronomy is an interesting hobby in a science. Um, it's one of the few hobbies you can get into where you can actually do serious astronomical observations and make serious contributions to, to science. Um, most sciences, you don't have very many, uh, you don't ever hear of, of a uh, amateur brain surgeon or an amateur heart surgeon. Uh, when I when I have heart issues, and I do, uh, I did not go to an amateur. I went to a professional cardiologist. But unlike so many other fields of science that you have, you have lay people that may be interested in it, but they're not really amateurs. They're just someone who's interested in medicine. And on the other hand, you have professional scientists who are doctors, medical doctors with degrees and certifications to, to treat our ills and our the things that are wrong with us. Uh, in astronomy, though, uh, an amateur astronomer, astronomer can make serious contributions to science. I've never really considered myself a uh, amateur. I've always considered myself just an astronomer. There is a long history of, uh, of people who we would call amateur astronomers who have made major significant contributions to science. Um, and the, no one ever considered these people, and no one today considers these people as amateurs. They're just, they're some of the biggest names in science today, and I'll give you a list of those in the future blog. Um, but uh, that's, that's kind of where I, I come from in this, this thing. My goal is to leave a legacy. Um, I always wanted to get my older granddaughter, who's now pushing 21 years old. Um, I've always wanted to get her, uh, when she was younger, interested in astronomy and hopefully pursue a STEM science. And unfortunately, because of circumstances we faced with her mother uh, during custody battles and things that were going on, uh, my son was divorced from his wife, and it, you can imagine the rest of it. 
Um, I was never able to have her on the times that I would need to have her at the house where I could take her out and do astronomy outside of the yard. And unfortunately, I didn't do that. I, I, if I had anything to do over with, I'd go back and fix that. But uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't get her involved in that at her at a young age. But today I have an, uh, a little granddaughter who just turned eight. And um, I am working right now in my mind, uh, I'm working a plan to try to encourage her in STEM sciences and get her interested in doing some type of science, maybe in the future, who knows, maybe as a professional, maybe as a, as a career choice. But most of all, just at her age to get her to help give her a fascination for science and for astronomy. So one of the things we're going to do with this blog, The Rambling Observer, is we're going to do some uh, discussion about various pieces of equipment that are used in astronomy. I'm going to start today with a, a introduction and a review of a product that I have bought my granddaughter for her birthday, which was this past Monday. Uh, she has not seen it yet. She was not home, and my wife and I left yesterday. Um, she was My granddaughter was coming home. Uh, we did not get to have a birthday party for her. She was with her mother, her mom, doing some stuff and uh, visiting some people and having parties and stuff, and she's going to come home. We're going to do something for her at our house, of course. Um, but anyway, I did not get to give her her birthday present on Monday, which worked out pretty good because I've got it with me here in San Antonio. I'm in, I'm in the Marriott uh, River, River Central or something like that hotel. My wife's here on business for, the, uh, for her company doing uh, some educational work. She's in education with the corporate world. And um, I, am, uh, I tagged along. We actually were married. In 1976, and this was our destination for our honeymoon, we spent uh, several days, uh, I don't remember the exact time frame, but we, we came to San Antonio for our our um, honeymoon 40, uh, 42 and three-fourths years ago and stayed at a hotel called the La Mancion, which is a very expensive hotel today. Uh, I understand. I, I'm going to stop by there sometime while I'm here this week. Um, but anyway, I'm telling you I'm in San Antonio for a reason. Um, I have purchased my granddaughter her first telescope, my little Isabella. She's nine. I mean, she's eight, just turned eight Monday. And what I decided to do to get her interested, to kind of start in front of one thing she always did, when she was just a little toddler, she would look out of the car and go, Papa, the moon, the moon. She was screaming at the top of her lungs. Uh, she just loved the moon. We would, I would get out, get her out of the car, and I'd be holding her, and she'd be pointing up at the sky and going, Papa, the moon, the moon. She just loved the moon. So I have bought her a first scope. Uh, telescope. It is actually called a Celestron First Scope Signature Series. Uh, Robert Reeves Moon Telescope. And so we're going to do a quick little unboxing of this telescope and do a, a little brief review. Um, it's a, I think it's going to be a great little instrument for her. I think it's the cutest little thing I've ever seen. Uh, it is limited in things that it can do. And it there are a few things that, um, that I would have done a little bit different. Uh, for one thing, it does not come with a finder scope, which is a serious flaw. You can buy a finder scope for it, but I'm not that excited about the finder scope they're selling. I'm going to probably buy a Celestron uh, red dot finder to put on this telescope. That'll probably be the first thing I'll buy her extra for the telescope. Um, and then a solar filter will be the other thing I will buy her so she can look at the moon and she can look at the sun with this telescope. I'm going to get her ready for the 2024 total solar eclipse in April. Of, of 2024 um, so she'll be a little bit older at that time but I've already unboxed this on the shipping crate it when you open the box up it has a little long box in here and it's got a few things inside this box um, uh, as you open the box up and you take out the little accessories it does not have which I think is an essential thing if you if you buy one of these for your child or your grandchild 
the first thing you need to do is find some kind of a finding scope for this little telescope. Um, finder scope, we we'll call it. Um, it does not have that. A red dot finder would be perfect, I think, for this, this instrument. Um, and um, that would allow you to sight that in with a bright street lamp, you know, a good ways from you or something. You get it sighted in, then you could point this thing easier at stuff like Jupiter and Saturn to see the rings of Saturn. And It's not just a moon telescope. It can be used for a number of other things. Uh, the telescope itself comes with um, a couple of little eyepieces. Uh, they're in little bags here. That's one of the eyepieces. This is a, uh, a, a 20 millimeter uh, Plossel, I believe, telescope. I believe it, it doesn't say on here Plossel, but I believe it's a Plossel. Um, it also has a little, another little, um, if I can get it open, another little eyepiece and a nice little container um, and it is a uh, it is a SR four millimeter I guess you can see that that way um, I'm not quite sure how useful this will be uh, I, I won't get this out in under the stars until I take her out with it probably it's in San Antonio the weather's not looking good uh, one, well, I didn't finish my story though the reason I have it here in San Antonio is Friday I'm going down and meeting Robert Reeves. And Robert is going to give me a book. There's a book that comes with this telescope. Um, it's called Bonus uh, Free Ebook Download Lunar Landscapes, the Photography of Robert Reeves. So Robert's going to give me the actual book. So I'll have that for my granddaughter. And he's also going to take this little telescope. We're going to unpack it right now. Um, he's going to take this little telescope, and it, it already has a signature on it by Robert Reeves. So we're going to swing this around so you can kind of see how this little puppy works. This is actually the top of the telescope. If you look right down, let's get that out of the way. If you look right down there, it says Robert Reeves. His signature is on there. Well, of course, this is a manufacturer, manufactured item. And uh, all of these Robert Reeves telescopes has his signature down on there. Well, he's going to actually sign the telescope for me. <laughs> so that's going to be kind of cool. I'm not sure where he's going to sign it yet. I don't know if we're going to use a white marker and sign up here, or if we're going to have him sign it actually on the moon map on here, which is, wouldn't be too bad a deal. Uh, I don't see that as being real useful. Um, it's got a few objects on here. You'll look on here and you'll find like a number five and the number four and number uh, eight it's got on the box it tells you what all these little these little uh numbers mean on the moon surface on the, this is a full moon photograph that robert reeves took uh number one is t the crater Tycho. number two is the crater ptolemy i'm sorry alphonsus and erasure um number three is uh ptolemy's number four is the sea of tranquilities Number five is the Sea of Crises, Crisis. Crisis. Uh, number six is Copernicus. Number seven is Monte um, Montes Ap Apennines. I never can pronounce that. It's a mountain range on the moon. Uh, number uh, eight is the Sea of Serenity. Number nine is the crater Plato, and of course, number ten is the Sinus Iridium region, and all that stuff you can Google. But uh, this is the Robert Reeves telescope as it comes in the box. Um, it has motion horizontally and has motion vertically. Um, so you can point up and down, as, which is altitude and azimuth is what we call it in astronomy. Um, this is a neat little telescope. I think this is really cute. The one big thing that I see it's missing as it comes in the box. And they're doing this to keep this cheap. You can get this telescope for less than $70. I think I paid uh, $59 or $69 when I ordered this. The very first thing that I will buy for her to add to this telescope will be a finder of some sort. It goes right here. Unfortunately, from what I understand, it only is designed to, to receive one celestron product 
that they sell for they sell sell a, an accessory kit to this telescope. I have not decided if I want to buy that or not. Personally, from what my experience with telescopes, I believe the little finder scope that they're selling in that little kit, which has a couple of eyepieces and things in it, um, I don't really think that finder scope is going to be that great. It would probably be, be good with the moon because it's so bright, but it would be probably pretty worthless if you were trying to look uh, at something like Jupiter or, or Saturn. It's just too small, and there's, there's, not, there's not enough latitude in, in the device to correct to correct the location as you what you what you do typically with a, tel- with a telescope like this is you sight in a street lamp or something distant a bright star will work too but you got to understand bright stars are are moving across the sky because the earth is rotating but anyway um, the first thing we're going to have to do is get some kind of little finder scope to go up here you take these off these little screws come off and um, it leaves open a little post. And so if I buy a red dot, find a little post on there, that little post, that's what I'm pointing at. And this little screw goes back over that post. And this is used, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is, this is simply used as a method to mount some kind of a finder scope. I don't think anything else will fit it, but that's one particular thing that comes in the, the kit. Got to get my focus back there. Um, anyway, uh, that's my first thing I'm going to recommend to you. If you buy this telescope, you really must get some kind of a finder scope. If you want to look at anything other than the moon, you need a red dot finder of some sort so you can sight in a star, a bright open cluster of stars, um, um, the planets, Jupiter. Uh, Mars, you, you can see all kinds of things in this little telescope. The telescope itself, to give you the particulars of the telescope itself, um, it has a uh, 300 millimeter focal length, which is a an F4 focus for a little, little reflecting. This is a reflecting telescope. This is a tiny Dobsonian reflecting telescope, is what it is. Uh, the aperture of the primary mirror, which is down here at the bottom of the telescope, it's inside here. And this is another problem I have with this design. Um, this is, seems to be sealed. I can't figure out how you take this little cover off. You've got to be able to get in there somehow to collimate this mirror. Um, it doesn't seem like it's made. It's made for a beginner in astronomy who's not going to be doing a lot of co- telescope collimation. Uh, but... Eventually, this thing's going to come out of be out of out of collimation. You're going to be able to collimate it. So I got to figure out that. It's one of the questions I may ask Robert what he what he thinks about it. Uh, how how you would do that? Anyway, it has a 76 millimeter aperture primary mirror, and um, it comes with two two eyepieces. One is a 20 millimeter eyepiece, uh, which gives you 15 power. They're both one and a quarter inch eyepieces. And it has a four millimeter, which is a 75 power eyepiece. I have a suspicion that that second eyepiece, that, that more powerful eyepiece is not going to be worth anything. I think it's probably going to be something you might as well throw in the trash. Uh, that's usually the case with the, with small telescopes you buy. You'll buy an instrument like a, a lot of times refractors, you'll see... Oh gosh, you'll see them at Fry's and these different stores, and they'll be advertised 300 power telescope. Like that's really helpful. Um, you get a little 2.4 inch refracting telescope and try to look at 300 power. You're not going to see nothing. Um, it's going to it, it, unless it's a clock driven instrument tracking the moon or tracking one of the planets or tracking an object in the sky. That high power is worthless. Most of my observing is done at low power. Uh, this little telescope's low power is going to be, uh, I just read it, um, 15 power. That's going to be your prime, and that's where you start every observing session. You're going to turn to that 15 power eyepiece, and you're going to side in what you want to look at. Then you go to another eyepiece if you want to get the moon more magnification and really see detail. And you got to understand when you're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, when you're looking at an astronomical object, 
such as the moon. You side in what area of the moon you're wanting to look at. Let's say, let's say we're going to look at the crater Copernicus. You find it and center it in your low power eyepiece. You pull your low power eyepiece out, slide your another another power like a medium power eyepiece in, and then you look at it to get more power and refocus. Uh, and you can pump that up. I have actually observed the moon. It's probably 1,200 power before, but that is extremely rare. That was on an 18-inch um, Starmaster Newtonian telescope that I owned. <laughs> I won't cry every time I think about that telescope. I had to sell it right after I graduated from seminary. And uh, I have I have mourned that telescope ever since. But anyway, uh, on, on occasion, you will get a very – Steady night of observing, great seeing, great transparency, and you can pump those suckers up when you get a big mirror like that. You can pump those suckers up. I, like I said, I've been I've been in twelve, probably to fifteen hundred power before, um, and, and, but it's so rare. I'm talking about. I think I've done that twice, and I'm using different telescopes in my fifty-seven years of astronomy. Um, it's not something you very you do very often there's no need for it uh for, first of all um, as you increase your magnification you also increase the atmospheric effects that are that are causing the crummy scene and the crummy transparency um, you're looking through an atmosphere it's like looking through boiling water the atmosphere literally boils and you the, when you start magnifying that effect that you see in your eyepieces when you're looking through a telescope, as you magnify that by using a higher power, you see more and more distortion of whatever you're looking at. So I highly recommend you start out always with a low power and you can bump that up gradually. But a little telescope like this, one thing that that is a little bit of a, this is the back end of your telescope. There are probably I have no idea how this is manufactured. I haven't seen anything that shows how they manufactured this telescope. Hopefully, it's got a little a little holder back here that has some little, probably three adjustment screws on it that you can use to collimate this telescope. If it doesn't have that, and you get in a collimation, it's going to be, I wouldn't say worthless, but you're not going to be that happy with the views. Um, every Newtonian telescope has to be collimated. And nowadays they do most of the collimation you, 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 you do, you use a laser collimator. It's a device that you put up here where the eyepiece goes. It goes in here. And we'll, I'll do this real quick to give you kind of an idea of how this little scope works. Uh, you open these little locks down and, um, I think I'm going to show it to you if I can get this off here. Um, you open.